thank you all for coming. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, <coughs> modeling and control for robotic assistants. Uh, so as uh, our uh, introducer said, I'm coming from the University of Pennsylvania, um, and I'm really excited to work with many of you. So uh, as a quick outline for our talk, um, I'll first give a brief outline about what um, the assistive robotics uh, and manipulation lab uh, plans to do. Um, and so, and then we'll follow into work uh, that we'll actually talk about from work that I did in my dissertation. So the first project that we're kind of looking at uh, starting off is how can robots actually work with human collaborators to carry objects in cluttered environments. Uh, we'll begin to look at how robots can work with uh, first responders to actually anticipate what they're trying to do so you don't have to have a lot of explicit communication. So how can they enable and amplify whatever their goals or tasks are. Um, and then we want to actually improve the overall ability of these robotic assistants to manipulate things in their environment. And to do this, we have to improve their ability to be uh, dexterous. And so all of these uh, can broadly be classified as uh, how you can actually improve a robotic assistant. Um, and then even beyond this, we'll begin to think about um, intelligent wearables, so a prosthetic arm, which I'll discuss in a moment. Uh, and then even how can you actually uh, improve prosthetic legs uh, without having very invasive uh, technology so that you know, the robot can understand what's going on in the environment and anticipate what the human user is trying to do. Uh, and then I'm going to talk uh, more in depth about uh, work that I had previously done in the terms of a wet lab robotic assistant, uh, specifically looking at the tasks of robotic precision pouring, um, as well as uh, the initial efforts toward uh, cooperative transport. So if you really think about the trajectory of robotics, uh, really in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of uh, automation. So you have you know, these very powerful robots that are able to do repetitive tasks very quickly. Um, and that's very effective uh, in the manufacturing standpoint. Um, and then in the uh, 2000s, we began to see the emergence of uh, autonomy. So robots that are able to understand the environment and their place in it. And now we're beginning to see uh, the embarking on uh, really augmentation. So robots that are able to not only uh, do tasks well and understand the control problem, uh, and then on top of that, understand the environment and their place in it, but then how can they also work with humans uh, that they may need to collaborate with uh, for very complex tasks. So for the assistive robotics and manipulation laboratory, we really want to look at this problem of how uh, the robot can understand people and the environment um, and the complex tasks that they're asked to do. Um, so in order to do this, you can imagine you have to be able to perceive the human in your environment. You need to be able to take actions that interact with them. You need to be able to perceive the task in the environment and take actions for the task and the environment. Um, and you need to have models that interplay between what you expect the human to do, how you expect the task to process or change, and what your robot model is that will allow you to achieve your overall desired outcome. So if we really think about uh, really the, the scope of the uh, uh, ARM lab, uh, we have robotic assistance where the goal is to enable and amplify uh, the efforts of a human collaborator. So, you know, understand what they're trying to do. And if they're doing an effort, how can you assist them to uh, help them reach that goal? Um, and then even parallel to that, how can you perform complex uh, service tasks for them? In the space of connected devices, you can imagine uh, having things that don't have actuation, like your phone and a smart home and devices like that. And how can these devices uh, understand what the human user is trying to do and anticipate uh, what they need you to do in order to reach their goal? So imagine uh, you have, you're walking into a building and you have uh, low mobility. If you have a smartphone that understands you know, your limitations, can it talk with the building so that you know, the door understands that you will need particular help you know, to navigate through this space? And that can be uh, lead to anticipation. So there's this common theme working here. Uh, and then finally, intelligent wearables, which stand between you know, the human and the world so that you can actually perform some task. Maybe it's a wheelchair. Maybe it's a, a service, like an arm, a prosthetic arm. Um, but how can this actually understand what the human is trying to do, understand the task, and predict uh, what it should do in order to enable the human to perform whatever task they're trying to do? So these are my current PhD students. I'm really lucky to have found these amazing people so far. Um, starting off with Ely's work, uh, she's looking into the human-robot collaborative uh, transport problem where the motivation is, uh, can the robot assist in carrying an object in a cluttered environment? Right? And you want to do this with low explicit communication. You don't want to have to tell your robot, go left, go right. It should be able to understand what you're trying to do like another human would and allow you to achieve that goal. So some of the problems we see in this space um, are really how do you actually extract this intent from your human leader? Um, and 
um, the information from the environment, how can you use those things together uh, to predict where you need to go. And then uh, if you actually think about this, you're actually trying to model that human intent. This is a very complex thing to model. So what form uh, should such a model take? Um, and what cues can we take from understanding uh, the relationship between inputs and outputs um, in order to construct the appropriate model that allows us to do the maximum with the least amount of data uh, possible? And so approaches, what we're looking at here, um, is really thinking about how we should design this model in order to achieve that outcome. Should we consider you know, time history? Uh, how can we actually construct this so that we can be informed by the physics of the situation that's going on? So very exciting work. Juan is working with me uh, to improve the dexterous manipulation. So the idea here is you know, ultimately we want to have robots that can manipulate very small things. Um, and more importantly, when you're manipulating something, uh, you want to have a notion of how uh, good you're doing as you're doing it. So what's the stability of the grasp? Um, and a lot of sensors are able to detect the failure mode. So if you have a contact normal sensor and something slips out of your hand, you know when it slips out, but you don't necessarily always know when the onset of slipping is occurring. So how can you assess the quality? So there are some new sensors that are emerging in this space, but we have some really interesting ideas on how to improve that, uh, those types of sensors and therefore those capabilities as well. So we want to detect those normal and shear forces um, in these soft fingertips. Um, and to do this, we want to, as mechanical engineers, leverage our knowledge of continual mechanics to give us a leg up. Um, and so we want to actually understand the internal deformation of fingertips and relate this back to the boundary forces, uh, which will allow us hopefully to have a very dexterous finger that gives us a lot of information. Uh, finally, we have a project here with Shivani, uh, where the goal here is to actually help those who are using uh, prosthetic arms. So um, you may not be aware, but a lot of times it's really difficult. There's a huge learning curve, learning how to operate some of these arms, and learning how to do so uh, very accurately can take a very long time to become skilled at. So the question is, if you have an arm that's able to perceive its environment, can you actually uh, decrease this learning curve so that the person can operate this at the level of skill much faster than if they had to learn how to completely control this uh, system on its own without it being informed about uh, its environment. Um, and then how do you actually handle um, the inputs from the human to predict what it is they're trying to do? Um, and then even think about the objects in your environment. What are their affordances? How should they be manipulated? And how can that actually govern the way you move to things so that the human has an understanding of how you're moving and understands what your goal is so you can be in unison as you're doing such things? Um, and so really, we're looking at this problem. How do you uh, model the human? You may have some EMGs attached. Um, and then uh, how do you interact with the environment, visual tactile measurements, and then close this loop um, to make these arms easier to use? So backing up a little bit, thinking, why is modeling important for robotic tasks? So number one is safety. So I love this example. You know, you have a car, let's say you have a self-driving car, it's just driving along, and you don't know anything about the world, and you're going to learn is from experience. Sometimes if you drive into a ditch and you're like standing on the hood, you may not be able to recover from such a thing. So sometimes it's really good to model your environment if there's high risk involved. And then uh, is the value of prediction. So if you do have a model of your environment, you can also, uh, beyond understanding safety, you can even understand how your action will affect um, and process whatever is going to occur. And you can understand what you need to do in order to better reach your intended outcome. So the hard question is, uh, what appropriate form should models take? Uh, and there's a lot of answers uh, to this question. Um, so you can think of analytical or reduced order models. So imagine like an equation. Uh, you have non-parametric methods. These are like Gaussian processes, neural networks. And then if you know absolutely nothing, uh, reinforcement learning where you're actually exploring your environment and building such a model. So this direction tells you you know, you know, you know less uh, about the true underlying model, about what's going on. But in this direction, uh, this is often uh, uh, helpful for complex tasks. Uh, you can be more time and computationally efficient um, if you have these representations that you can leverage. So uh, what does it mean for a robot to reason about a complex task? So imagine I give you a state space, right? So this is a manifold. Um, and imagine that the uh, state of the system is a position on this uh, curve. So if I have observed or training data, like let's imagine this, this ball trans uh, uh, moves on these, this curve. So this is the physics of this system or this state. right? So then you can actually have observed training data on how the system will change with these initial conditions. Um, and then you have some current state, which is actually occurring. 
And the challenge occurs uh, when you have you know, data-driven approaches. Um, you can really characterize the regions that you've observed, um, but sometimes if you haven't seen particular regions, you can't say anything useful about it. Um, and if you have analytical representations or reduced order models, uh, you may be able to have some uh, valid approximation within those regions that you know, that uh, representation is actually valid. And so the question becomes, can the robot predict the processing of this state? So uh, why are these robotic assistants uh, advantageous? So if we take a look at all of this stuff for modeling, we say, okay, let's zero in for robotic assistants. Uh, why would you actually want to have these? So again, you can imagine if you can do these types of complex tasks for people, um, you can actually improve safety um, as well as convenience if you're able to do these things uh, for them and actually augment their abilities. And what's also nice um, is many times if you solve some of these problems, they'll actually overlap well in different spaces. So uh, for the wet lab robotic assistant, uh, you can imagine a lot of uh, useful tasks being the ability to pour precisely, the ability to carry um, in the wet lab space, possibly like boxes or tables, uh, restocking and replacing equipment, cleaning up spills, um, as well as uh, maintaining cultures while the scientists are away. In my uh, dissertation work, I really focused on these first two tasks, and we'll zero in on those and investigate those problems of modeling and control that we talked about before. So starting with uh, precision pouring, how can you complete such a complex task? So again, imagine you know, this state transition model here. So here, x is the state. Uh, z is your perception or the measurements. Uh, the objective is to reach some target state. Uh, some final state, and you're able to actually um, input, you know, or uh, process the state with some inputs U. So uh, in the case of pouring, the paradigm is, imagine you have two containers, and you want to pour precisely, but you have to pour the precise amount of fluid in a single attempt. What do you do? So in this case, modeling is extremely important because you don't have more than one chance to pour chemical X. And so uh, looking at this, the goals are, uh, can we pour using containers that are already found in the lab so you don't want to manufacture your own ultimately? Um, can you pour precisely? Can you pour quickly? Um, and then if you want to minimize the tool change requirement and have a versatile manipulator, can you, know, can you actually have a system that can interact with your environment, pour from containers that you'd normally see um, and be effective in that way instead of having something that has pipettes built into the arms, uh, for instance? And the advantages of this um, is that if you can actually help a scientist prepare such experiments, you can actually save a lot of time and therefore money. Um, and if you're also manipulating very dangerous materials, you can actually improve the safety for the uh, wet lab researcher. So to see how hard this problem is, uh, we have this video. So uh, decomposing this, uh, we see that as she began to pour, uh, spillage was a problem. Perceiving the fluid in the container was challenging. Attenuating the rotation based on the fluid flow was challenging. Uh, and anticipating the time delay uh, during the pour as the fluid exited the container was both uh, challenging and shocking. And so when you think about uh, our robots, if they get shocked, they're kaput. So we don't want that to happen. So additional challenges here um, is perceiving the container. How can you see the container? Um, how can you see fluids inside of the container? And then how do you actually uh, have a reduced order model for uh, the flow dynamics? So we'll look at two cases, one where both containers um, are, the geometries of both containers are known, and one case where it's not known, the pouring uh, geometry is not known but approximated. So in this first case, we'll only observe the receiving container's uh, volume. And in the second case, we'll be able to scan the pouring container um, and monitor the receiving container's volume during the pour. So the assumptions for the first case um, are the fact that the geometry uh, of the containers um, are known, no spilling occurs, the volume in the receiver is observable, and the time delay uh, for the small container is negligible. So the amount of time it takes to fall from the pouring container into the receiver. So it's on the order of about 0.1 seconds for about a 10 centimeter above the receiving container. So the problem statement is what input 
uh, rotation of the pouring container should we put in in order to achieve some desired volume. And if you know the receiver geometry, this can relate to the height inside of the receiver. So looking at previous work that did similar things, this work was done at the University of Washington. Here the idea was to say, you know, if we wanted to just pour for conventional use, like you know, drinking water, for instance, maybe it's not necessary to have extremely precise measurements of the fluid in the receiver. And this is valid for this use case, uh, but we wanted ours to be more precise. Um, here, in this work, they actually poured very precisely, uh, but a lot of uh, knowledge was known about the pouring container. Um, and in our, the next phase of the work, we want to relax that assumption. Um, and then in this work, they have a very specialized robot. But remember, uh, this one is able to pipette into you know, the, the given uh, fluid into the desired container. Um, but if you actually wanted this to be very versatile and be able to transition to carrying something, uh, this setup is, is not good for transitioning to additional tasks. So for our first pass at this, uh, we had this experimental setup. We used the uh, Rethink Sawyer robot. Uh, we manufactured our own container geometry, which I'll explain why we chose this shape in a moment. And we observed the volume with a camera. And the scale you see here was used for ground truthing um, so that this had both a control and a, and a cool vision uh, aspect to it. So thinking about the uh, flow dynamics, here we used uh, the following volumetric flow rate model. So we have the fluid in the beta container, um, and this is going to be changing at, at a rate at which, which you rotate the fluid outside of the pouring container. Um, and there's some associated time delay. And for right now, we're assuming that time delay is just attributed to the amount of time it takes for the fluid to exit uh, the pouring container and fall into the receiver. And so you can break up the uh, volume in the pouring container into the volume above the pouring lip, the L alpha, and the volume uh, below the pouring lip, uh, Vs alpha. Uh, below the surface, and this L is the height of the fluid, this H is the height of the fluid at the lip um, as you begin to pour. And theta is the rotation angle for that pouring container. So here you can actually represent these uh, different volumes. Here this is the area of the base of the pouring container, cylindric, cylindrical, and you can integrate to the height of the container, uh, height of the fluid. Uh, this is approximation for the volume above the pouring lip and the volume below the pouring lip. So if you substitute these uh, terms in, you have an expression for the flow rate uh, from this above equation for uh, the fluid that's exiting the pore and the flow rate that's entering the receiver. And if you zero in on the fluid at the pouring lip, uh, if you have an expression for the geometry of the lip um, and an expression for the area, um, cross-sectional area of the fluid, um, and you assume that HL is relatively small, you can approximate uh, the Bernoulli flow of the exit uh, velocity of the fluid uh, with this following equation from Bernoulli. So if we really look, the, uh, look at the geometry of the uh, pouring container, um, if we choose a square geometry for simplicity, uh, where all of these uh, terms represent the different dimensions, the, the length of the lip, the height of the fluid above, the height of the entire container, the length and width of the container, um, then we can uh, specify the length in this term, the flow rate, um, as we mentioned from uh, Bernoulli, integrating becomes this, and if we differentiate it, uh, it becomes this term, where here L is the uh, lip length dimension, and this H here is the height of the fluid above the pouring lip. And then, if we look at the volume uh, below uh, the container, uh, the function of the height of the container comes into play. You can differentiate that um, to receive uh, this term here. This is the length of the container and the width of the container. Um, and then this can all be used to actually find our final dynamic. So if we take the original flow rate equation and we differentiate it once, we have the differentiation of the flow rate and the change, the acceleration of the uh, volume uh, inside of the receiving container. And this expands into this following dynamics where these E terms are substituted here um, in terms of all the parameters that are uh, the geometry of this pouring uh, container. <laughs> So if we define our state vector, the things we care about, as the height or the volume inside of the pouring container, its derivative and the angle of the rotating uh, pouring container, uh, then we can take those dynamics I showed you on the previous slide and represent them in this really nice form, x dot is equal to f of x plus g of x u, um, where here e is as we had those terms in the previous slide. And our goal is to control the volume and the change in volume inside of the receiving container, hence this output matrix, which is a function of our state, obviously. So the output error is defined as tracking some trajectory of volume inside of the receiving container. 
So uh, the question is, how do you define such a trajectory, and how do you do one that allows you to actually meet your objective? So if you just set you know, the final volume as your goal and you begin to pour, you could easily overshoot. So if you have a trajectory that you're tracking, um, it's easier to not overshoot that target volume. So we chose a fifth order polynomial that minimized jerk. Um, and there's supporting literature that says this can help with even sloshing as you're beginning to pour. Um, and by choosing uh, the dynamics as we did in the output equations that we have, we can show that this is, the output is feedback linearizable because uh, this matrix is full uh, rank and involutive where G of X is the matrix multiplied by your control term. Um, and uh, this is like the Lie bracket uh, with the uh, passive dynamics. So uh, this is stable when uh, these two conditions on the state are met. And that's to say that the height in the fluid uh, receiving container is changing or therefore rising. Uh, and your angle is not at the extremum points, which is you know, plus or minus 90 degrees. Um, so if those two conditions are met, um, then you are uh, feedback linearizable. And you can control it to your objective volume. So taking that error, uh, we can represent our objective function in this fashion. Uh, where we want to minimize the error from that trajectory that we're trying to track subject to the dynamics of the system. So we propose the following hybrid controller. Uh, so here, uh, because we said it was feedback linearizable, the idea here is you can do the uh, pseudo inverse of our G here and reflect this through, and then you can send your objective function through as your target uh, behavior, where you're tracking a feed forward term and then a PD controller on your error and its derivative. And so uh, this uh, feedback linearization uh, policy for this hybrid state uh, becomes this following matrix, which is stable in this case. I should also mention that uh, we have this, uh, this stability for this hybrid state. This following state um, initiates flow. So if you're pouring and that condition that the height uh, is changing is uh, uh, not correct because maybe you overshot your goal and so you came off of it to stop the pouring, so, uh, then this one reinitiates the pour so that you get bumped back into this hybrid state, which we then know is stable. Um, and then this state here tells us if you're past the extremum, if you're not inside of that region, then stop, because we know that uh, you've poured too much. So if there is fluid inside um, and it's not beginning to pour, this one initiates pour, and then we have this stability term. And you oscillate between these two states where this pushes you here, and then this is stable. So uh, for, we did this for many different uh, volumes here, 80 milliliters, 100, and 120. Um, and those were the results. And then uh, to really show the statistics, we poured this 100 times um, on 10 second trajectories um, to reach our target uh, volume. And this is the uh, work that you can check out uh, to see more about that. So a quick video it displays. Let's see if this. Uh, demonstrating this work, there we go. So here, um, the fluid is blue, so we can easily track it using online background subtraction. Um, and what you see here um, is k-means clustering uh, that helps detect between the fluid entering the container, and uh, which is coming down from the top, and the fluid rising. The green line uh, is a filtering line, so we don't scan for the boundary of, this, of the fluid above that line, so it moves with us. It's a filtering line. And the red line uh, indicates our target volume. So in the next phase of this work, we wanted to improve this. We don't want to just pour from square containers. We don't want our fluid to always be blue. So how can we improve the perception? Um, so here what we did was we had this setup, so you have a camera, and now in this work we combine both vision um, and a weight, a scale, uh, to help us detect that volume inside of the receiving container. Um, and we assume now that the receiving container is still a cylinder, um, and we use a CNN to actually allow us to track uh, fluids of ranging transparencies and colors um, by leveraging distortion or occlusion of a background. And so with this, we're able to use a Kalman filter to actually estimate the state um, at 30 hertz, where vision and weight are running respectively at 21 and 12 hertz. So we've covered the case where both container geometries are known. Now what if one is not known? Can we scan it and estimate it or say something uh, about it in order to pour precisely still? So in this case, again, we observe, we can observe, we uh, uh, assert that we can observe the pouring uh, container. And so that's what we want to do. So now the question becomes, can we estimate the essential geometric uh, characteristic in order to allow us to determine what input we should pour in order to track the, the volume that we actually want to pour? 
So the full state machine of this system, because remember we wanted this to be a very versatile setup, uh, is this state machine here. Um, so this describes an entire process of going, picking it up, scanning it, picking it up, transporting it, pouring it, and placing it back. Um, the hardest parts of this are definitely scanning the container geometry and performing that precision pour. So the, uh, the reduced order model is very similar to the one we had before. This is the uh, volume in the receiver, how it changes the volume in the pour as it's exiting. Um, and we have this T fall time. You can break the volume in the uh, pouring container into the steady state, which is if you held the theta at a constant rate, this blue should remain there and the red should pour off uh, due to gravity. And we can make the approximation uh, that uh, if we actually think in more of the steady state transient uh, case, we can incorporate the transient into the fall time with some time delay TD that's a function of the geometry of the container so that we can have a more simplistic representation uh, equating this to the steady state of the uh, volume inside of the pouring container. And so, uh, as I just said, the time delay is going to be a function of the geometry, where this capital gamma is uh, a term that represents this geometry. And we're assuming that we're pouring from uh, symmetric containers. So you just need to know the profile in one place to, have to uh, revolve that and have the geometry of the entire container. And the volumetric uh, error is, as we defined before, uh, we want to track some trajectory of the volume inside of the receiving container um, from the current uh, volume uh, that's inside. Uh, and so we can, again, make a, a pouring objective, in this case, that's subject to the dynamics of the system. Um, and so the key aspect here was how do you have, what's the relationship the between the geometry and how you expect the volume to exit uh, the pouring container. So here, if I think about the steady state volume inside of the pouring container, if I held it at a particular angle, there's a maximum amount of fluid that could be inside of that container at that particular angle, assuming that your, uh, your container is almost convex. So if you give me a weird geometry like a spiral container, this might not be true. But for a relatively convex container, for a particular angle, there's a maximum amount of fluid that can be in that container at that angle. And so this produces a one-dimensional uh, volume, maximum volume versus angle curve. And if you pour for many containers, you can see that they each have their own sort of unique curve, which is a function of their geometry. So we began to understand that there was some relation here. Um, and we wanted to make the steady state assertion that if I can have this curve, the steady state curve for the pouring container, um, because that's what's causing the fluid to exit, um, then in the dynamics problem, I can say that the change in volume at a particular angle in the receiver uh, would be the equal and opposite for its derivative. This is the first derivative. Um, it would change in the same fashion if you were to move in a steady state way. So understanding for symmetric containers this similarity assumption. So if we define this error metric of the geometry such that if I have uh, the height of the container, h1 and h2, um, and I parameterize s going from 0 to 1 base to top, right? then if I uh, take the difference between the consecutive points uh, as I go from s going to 0 to 1, I can uh, and I square this, I can make this uh, error function that's really useful for comparison this uh, for uh, noting the comparison between the similarity of multiple containers. And the similarity assumption is as, these, as this error goes to zero, uh, these maximum volume curves also would approach each other. So in practice, we can then scan a container's geometry and extract uh, this, uh, if it's uh, uh, symmetric, we can extract this geometry function, uh, which is, again, our uh, height uh, versus radius function. And we can also simulate uh, these uh, sort of containers as well. So we use the software NVIDIA Flex uh, to pour the fluid. Um, and we actually uh, empirically matched uh, the fluid properties to that of water so we could see how we'd expect that maximum volume versus angle curve to actually uh, be generated. Um, and so if you have an, a new container, if you pour from hundreds of these different ones in simulation, you can see how close these geometries are. Um, and you can make an assertion about the similarity in those maximum volume curves for the fluid. So, our, uh, our control diagram looks uh, like this, where we have some input uh, volume trajectory that we're trying to track. We have a controller, which is a function of the error um, of the geometry, that maximum volume curve, as we mentioned uh, in that flow rate dynamics, and some associated time delay. Uh, so we have to do some MPC here. Uh, and then you have the plant, which outputs your uh, observed volume and the angle of the pore. Um, and we're trying to approximate in real time what this maximum volume curve is as a function of the geometry and what that time delay is. 
So what we want to do is we want to realize, OK, you know, it's really hard you know, to do this, especially if you're pulling this container from the very first time. Uh, so can we use a combination of tools? Can we use online system identification? Um, so if you have a parametric function, uh, can you approximate the pores, the points that you've seen in the past? Um, and if you have these model priors from simulation, uh, can you actually uh, leverage these as well? And so uh, the work that I'll show you here really sits at the intersection of both the analytical reduced order model as well as uh, more of the non-parametric methods, and we make the semi-parametric, which I'll tell you uh, in a second. So for the parametric case, for the online system identification, you're pouring, and as you pour, you observe that maximum volume uh, versus angle curve, right? And you can use a, a, a power series polynomial to represent that curve as you're beginning to pour. Uh, and so to do this, we actually optimize using this following objective function. And what the components do here is, it says as you begin to pour, you observed uh, the different volume, uh, max volume versus angle as you began to pour. And as you're fitting this, you can try to minimize the residual from the polynomial at those points that you've observed. Uh, but you don't want future points, if you want to use this for prediction, you don't want this to diverge, even though it locally fit uh, what you uh, observed. So you want a regulator term that says, don't let the coefficients get too big. Keep them reasonable so that they don't, you know, they're not useless uh, beyond where I've already observed, because I want to use this for prediction. Um, and then you can actually have a term that actually allows the system to respect the physics. So this term says that the, uh, that the derivative, if you use control points, the derivative of control points should never be uh, zero in the future. So as you're pouring, the volume will never decrease. It will always uh, increase inside of the receiving volume. So for thinking about how we can actually leverage the containers we poured from uh, in the past, uh, we use a Gaussian process for that non-parametric method. So to do this, we have a kernel function. And this kernel function really just says, if I have a data, piece of data that I've seen before and a new piece of data, how close are they? How much can I rely on that previous data to tell me about the new piece of data that I've seen? So here, this is using um, the, uh, this Gaussian here um, with white noise uh, inside of your kernel. And this uh, function here, which tells you how much spread it is, uh, really um, is a function of the edge error of the geometry. So if the distance between the points are very large, then this correlates uh, to what your expected uh, uh, behavior would be for those different containers at a particular angle. And so with this kernel function, we can actually construct these covariance matrices that allow us to have a notion for how the uh, training data associated with each other um, and how they, each of these points would associate with a new test point that we were to insert into the system. Um, and for the Gaussian process, this allows us to create the information matrix uh, where this K is the training K, and this is a small constant, this is the identity, uh, and this is the information matrix. And what's really nice is this is training in one shot. If you have all of this data stored, you can put it into this covariance matrix, and this is your trained model. So the non-parametric estimate then uses the, uh, the test uh, covariance with our information gain um, and the new data points we uh, observe to then extract what uh, our, our training data to extract what we expect our new uh, maximum volume curve to be at a particular point that we're querying. And if we want to combine these things, the uh, online system identification and this Gaussian process, we can put them together to make this entire semi-parametric model to estimate what that maximum volume curve would be at a particular angle. So here is our parametric form. This is the power series representing the, the pore. Uh, this uh, is a mixture probability saying if you choose the top 10 containers in simulation that were closest to the geometry that you had, how close were you to that container? And you can use that error function for geometry to give you that mixture probability, uh, where this, again, sums to 1. Uh, you have that test covariance for this container versus all the training containers, those top tra 10 training containers that you're using, the associated information matrix, uh, the training um, output, and the training points that you use. Um, and if you combine all of these in this fashion, you can get the best of both worlds. And that's what I hope to prove to you in the next few slides. So uh, for the time delay, uh, again, we had to estimate this because there's a significant time delay for how much time it takes the fluid to exit the pore and fall uh, into the receiver. So uh, again, if you take the top 10 containers that are closest to your geometry and you assert that the relationship between the input, the angle, and the geometry of the container is a smooth and continuous space, um, then we can actually make this uh, model approximation which we found worked very well, 
saying if I, if I understand my geometry, given all of the test uh, cases, if my container is close or similar to one in my training set, I can put my uh, geometry through the CNN, add this to uh, my theta and my input uh, to have an estimate of what I expect my time delay to be. And we found that this was a decent approximation enough for us to uh, be able to control the system and uh, use that uh, predictive control aspect. So the hybrid control strategy in this regard has a few more hybrid and guard states. So again, uh, you know, you have that, uh, those multiple states. What are the transitions? So before we go into that, this one is just to say, uh, if, is the angle within the joint limits? This is to say, is the volume in the receiver constantly increasing? Uh, uh, and then this one says, uh, does the volume profile uh, for the max volume curve, does that respect the physics as well? And then is the volume actually increasing? Um, and then is the uh, error function for the trajectory that you're trying to track uh, positive? And so now we have a very similar uh, 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 hybrid controller uh, where, again, this is a positive gain that allows you to rotate uh, and pour the precise amount of fluid. Um, and this initiates flow. And when you're in this state, we're going to talk about the stability regions that allow you to actually track whatever uh, trajectory you're trying to pour to. So for controller stability, we have our error function. We're tracking some desired volume in the receiver. We have our current volume. Right? We can expand this um, in terms of integrating from all of our past actions till now. Um, and we want to minimize uh, this error function. So if we choose this Lipinoff function here, then the conditions uh, for, stability, uh, for stability become uh, if the desired trajectory is not changing. So you're telling it to go to a constant uh, volume, and you haven't passed that, obviously. Um, then the conditions for stability are that this is true. And if you solve this out, this just means that your KP is positive. Um, if your trajectory is changing, uh, then you have like the uh, trying to catch the missile problem, right? So it's uh, the escape velocity. So you're, uh, you need a KP that allows this condition to be true. If this is not uh, satisfied, then hopefully your trajectory generator will pause because you've gotten too far away, and you'll be back into this condition. And as long as your KP is positive, you'll catch up again. So how do you determine what trajectory you want to use? So if you know what your final volume is inside of your uh, receiving container that you want to pour, you can use a, a simple uh, trajectory, uh, a trapezoidal trajectory, to allow you to pour. What's interesting about the method that we decided uh, in our paper was to say, uh, can you actually change uh, this trajectory generation based on how well your approximation is doing? So if you're doing a really bad job, don't pour quickly. Uh, but if you know that you're doing a really good job of estimating the geometry of the container, then you can be more aggressive as you pour. And that helps you meet your uh, optimal thing, which is to pour as quickly uh, as possible. So the data for this uh, is, as you can see here, so for this particular container, um, uh, for all of our containers, we poured these number of trials. But this just demonstrates for one case. These show you the uh, error, volume error in milliliters for pouring 100, 150, and 200 milliliter targets. This is the amount of time that it took. Um, and if you're not familiar with this graph form, this is like a box plot. Uh, but what these show you on the side is a violin plot. Shows you the distribution of the data. So for all these 30 points, what that distribution is in addition to the statistics of a regular box plot, uh, mean, uh, your uh, second and third quartile, uh, SRM. So uh, these are for the parametric method, which is just using the fitting of the curve of the uh, reduced order uh, power series curve. This is the non-parametric, just the Gaussian process. And this is the combined method that uh, we saw. So one thing I want to kind of uh, bring to light is you notice that the majority of the data uh, is really between, can be interpolated between the parametric and the non-parametric uh, form. And this is really important for a reason I'll, I'll state in a second. So this is over many different containers. Uh, again, you can see uh, for 100 milliliters, 200 milliliters, how, again, the semi-parametrics performance interpolates well between these two containers. So you might say, in some of these cases, um, it's clear that one of the methods, like the parametric, seems to be outperforming uh, both others. So why not just pick one or go with that? Uh, so in thinking in the, in the frame of if you have a deployable system that you're never going to touch again, um, if you wanted to, to choose and commit to an, a particular path, what's the best one that will always optimize the expected outcome? Take this case. So if I have a container that's very far from all of the example containers that I was able to pour from, uh, that in this case, uh, the non-parametric performs really bad, um, but still I have this interpolated behavior. So in some cases, the non-parametric did well if you had data, 
but then when you don't have data, it can perform poorly. So how can you get the best of both worlds? And my argument is by using a combination of them in the semi-parametric method that's informed about the quality of both. Um, and then this just uh, goes on to say, if you look at those maximum volume curves uh, for this container, um, these were the priors that were built for the angle versus volume. And if you zoom in for the, uh, 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 the power series fit, um, this is the iteration, how it quickly converged to uh, the actual container's uh, volume versus angle curve. So here we pour uh, 13 different containers, each one 10 times, uh, and we have two metrics to compare. Here we have the error versus the height of the container, and we have the time it took to pour versus the height of the container. Um, and what's interesting to note here um, is the fact that, uh, as you'd expect, if you have, uh, what we did was we, uh, we did put a lower bound on the lower rate at which you could rotate uh, your container. So as you're pouring this, um, if you have a longer container, the angle that you pass through will actually be a lot larger. And so uh, you'd actually want to pour slower for very, very long containers because uh, this uh, has that uh, adverse effect. But we had that lower limit. So you slowly see this increase. Um, but what's really nice is you know, by just fitting this line, uh, you see that it's actually not linear. Right? And so our algorithm is able to adapt and do the best it can um, given that lower limit. To have better performance, you could remove that lower limit and allow it to go slower uh, for larger containers if that's what you wanted to do. Um, so you can't see this very well. This outline here is like this. But this takes that uh, error and that time and puts it into a single plot um, and shows you the distribution of data. Where here, again, this is the tallest container. Uh, and this is the smaller containers. You can see that distribution. If you compare it to the most similar work uh, in the state of the art, uh, for we have similar times with a lot higher precision, making this the forefront use case for uh, precision pouring for the pharmaceutical space. So this uh, quick video demonstrates uh, the operation of the uh, situation. So here, you would go down and scan the container geometry. You would then construct the symmetric boundary. Uh, we had simulated uh, the pores in NVIDIA Flex. We did this for many different containers and geometries, yeah. So then you could pick the top 10 that are closest to the geometry of your container um, at runtime after you scan it. And similar to the last case, uh, the green line is the filter line, the red line is the target line. Um, this is the output from the CNN detecting the uh, volume inside. The net volume here, again, is the common filter combination of the weight and vision. Um, and here you have the hybrid state. Are you pouring the trajectory or are you initiating the pour? Uh, you can see the trajectory volume here. And the goal is to pour to 100 milliliters. And I think we do a decent job. Uh, and the comparison would be if you had a human doing this, uh, is it comparable to how they would actually do it? And we think that arguably, yes. Uh, so we took this to the KUKA Innovation Award uh, about two years ago. So um, this one was uh, more focused on just the system identification side. Um, but what's really nice about this video is it shows the entire pipeline that I mentioned, that full state machine, about how you could imagine going in, grasping you know, the container, um, and then using it to pour uh, the precise amount of fluid uh, that you want. So uh, again, the takeaways here now are uh, if you can actually have some knowledge about the physics of what you're trying to do, um, that's really great. And it can help you in the model construction. Um, and then you want your system to be adaptive. So what's the best modeling techniques you can do to allow it to be effective uh, in real world scenarios? Uh, and then as far as the controller goes, uh, you can then, given the appropriate model, build a stable controller uh, and one that accommodates the different modes that your system takes. So transitioning this now to the cooperative carrying problem, we want to see, okay, what lessons can we learn and how can we apply these similar things to this space? So again, you know, we have the state transition model. Assume you have a human who wants to go from point A to point B, uh, but they don't want to carry this alone. So imagine you're carrying a big flat screen TV through your living room. You don't want to bang it. Can the robot you know, work with you to help carry this? Um, let's make it like you know 60 inch TV. That's good. Yeah. All right. So then, if you uh, work on the perception side, so how can uh, the robot observe the human, observe the environment? How can you perform model and planning? Expect the human motion uh, and understand the combined system motion. And then, what control inputs should you do um, based on this information to achieve your objective? So if you actually watch these movers carry, and the volume is on, they're not talking. 
as they're doing this, but they do a really decent job of moving through this semi-cluttered environment, working together uh, to transport this, and they only bang it once, right there. Yeah. Other than that, they do a fantastic job. So we want our robot to do uh, uh, almost as well as they can, so how can we do this, right? So again, the assumptions are, let's say first, uh, just to think about this problem, assume you know where you want to take the system, uh, where you want to take the, the combined system, um, and you don't want to collide with obstacles, how can you actually do that as well as conserving energy during the transport? So if we define optimal transport um, as being going from pose A to B while avoiding collision with obstacles and conserving energy, um, then we can think about avoiding collision by first, if we know where we're going, establishing the free space region we should traverse to get there. And so finding that correct motion. How would, and we can think that all agents might want to agree on such trajectories, even on a local horizon if they're trying to move in the common uh, target direction. So to do this, we had some work that allowed us to characterize that free space. So if you use a sample-based method like RRT Connect to you know, find a, a sample path from your start to your goal, you can then optimize that by then taking those cores, constructing the free space region, and then you can actually allow your system to traverse uh, in that free space, optimizing whatever uh, metric you had, such as distance or time or jerk or whatever. Um, and if you compare this to uh, some of the competing uh, methods that exist, uh, Russ and Tedrick, they characterize free space, uh, but their algorithm expands ellipsoids to maximize that free space. Our problem is a little bit different because we just care about actually traversing that free space. We don't need to actually model all of the possible free space. So in this example, you know, I may not need to understand everything about these other halls. I just care about the region that I'm going to traverse. And that's the difference um, computationally between the algorithm that we proposed uh, and theirs. So focusing on forces uh, and conserving energy, uh, if you're trying to move uh, an object, uh, the forces along the connecting lines um, are called the interaction forces between two points that uh, are connecting. And those that aren't contribute to the motion. So stress or strain uh, or compression or tension along these lines, and then motion in these if you're not interacting with your environment. So if you uh, have the wrench, which is the force and torque of all agents, and the forces that each are applying, you can sum the forces, and R is their uh, contact vector. So this is the moments. So this is the skew symmetric matrix. And if you do this for all agents, uh, we can make this called our contact uh, uh, matrix G, uh, which is for each of those components. And our interaction forces, as I just mentioned, are if you take two pairwise forces, subtract them, as well as take the normal difference of the vector that connects them and project these along those vectors. Uh, these are these green lines you see here. These are your interaction forces. Uh, and what a lot of uh, work done in the 90, 80s and 90s uh, really looked at was to say, uh, if you wanted to make the interaction forces go to 0, if all of your agents agreed on something we'll call a solution vector, um, given their contact location, if they all have consensus on this, then this uh, mathematically requires that the interaction forces uh, be 0. And so in our work, we actually looked um, into this case, and we could think about multiple robots working together to achieve that. So if you're trying to, if you know the path that you need to take uh, in that free space, and you know what wrench you need to move along to, to move in that direction, uh, then the first thing you need to do is talk to other robots and say, what is the vector, solution vector that we should use? And if we all agree on that, uh, then we can use this for our dynamics. And we know that we'll actually conserve energy uh, via the forces that we're applying on our system as we transport. So now, if you wanted to work with a human, right, you may not be able to digitally communicate with them and share a consensus vector. So how do you do this? Right, so in this case, uh, we assume that the human has an intended goal, but this goal may be unknown to the robot. Right, so there's been some work in this space, um, but a lot of the times this work requires that the robot feels some interaction force in order to know that it should move in a particular way. So it's being compliant. So there's no prediction here. It doesn't understand what's happening. It's simply reacting, and we want to build on top of that. So if you think about all the technical challenges that um, exist in, in reaching to this point, you have adapting to the system dynamics, managing the load distributions, and then planning in these unstructured environments. So what I'm going to talk about now is how can you observe the human in the environment and plan about where you expect the system to go. Then you can use a controller on top of that to reach your target uh, location. So and you think about this, this is an extremely hard problem. How do you actually model the human in terms of everything that you can observe that's non-trivial? Uh, 
Um, and then what is the notion or how this, does this relate to the dynamics of the system, like you know, the wrench, the forces and the torques, um, given those forces that you observe? And then how can you even think about how the system will actually rotate or change as a function of watching the, the person's steps or the way their, their head is looking or the velocity of the system in order to predict that motion? So we realized that this is extremely hard to model. So what we assumed was that if we watched two humans do this, we could imagine that the human was the expert, and maybe we could transport that model from the humans uh, to the robot. So uh, again, these are our measurable quantities. You can see your environment. You can see the person's head. You can feel the torque and the forces applied here, the wrench. And you can feel the, watch the piece of person's feet, um, as well as uh, denote, uh, know this, the system's velocity as you're moving along. So we built this sensor um, that had the ability to see the person's face, feel the two-dimensional forces, watch the person's feet, um, and we use motion capture to extract the pose and velocity of the system. So we mapped the system uh, with a robot, and then we walked in this space. Uh, and so I was leading, and uh, my student was trying to just silently predict where I wanted to go, and uh, I think he did a decent job. There weren't too many forces. Uh, inside, and we did this inside of six maps. We just walked around these locations uh, where we picked a particular location, and then uh, you have to transport efficiently. So our first pass at this um, really said, okay, you know, if we uh, really want to take a notion of what things should be related, like the head and the step should predict the position, these are related to uh, like the velocity and acceleration, how should these things be combined in an intelligent way uh, to reach uh, the best outcome for predicting a future pose at uh, T plus TH, time horizon. Um, and going through many renditions of this uh, structure, we uh, uh, came down to this. And if you expand it, uh, this is the true form that this uh, neural network architecture took. Uh, and so the goal is to estimate the goal pose, plan a collision-free trajectory, and that's what this piece does. Uh, and then you want to control along the trajectory using a method like we discussed before. So with the network that we described, this was the output that we received for different look-ahead times, two seconds, one second, uh, 0.5 seconds, and 1.5 seconds. So filter is bold. And for the shortest time horizon, our error in predicting on the holdout set for the two humans carrying uh, was on the order of 10 centimeters, around 10 centimeters. Um, and when we looked at the prediction of the angular uh, offset error in our orientation, uh, we were within about 10 degrees. <laughs> And so uh, we assumed a Markov process. So you only need to observe what's happening at this instant to predict that time horizon ahead of time. Um, and so by changing the time horizon, the data size uh, changed. Um, and these are the outputs and performance for each of the time horizons and the different error and angles um, with and without the filter. Um, and what you'll see is if your time horizon is less, you're more accurate. Um, but if you can give yourself more time to, to predict, then you can actually do more things like plan and control and do other things computationally um, in, inside of that time. So comparing this, benchmarking this with just using velocity as an instantaneous predictor of where you're going to be on these look-ahead times, uh, you could see for all of our uh, data the um, difference in that performance on the holdout set. Um, likewise for you know, the angle in degrees. <laughs> So for this next quick video I'll show, uh, this position is where my uh, feet is. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see the uh, reference frames for the object that was being carried. The red is where we've been, and the purple is predicting, uh, the system predicting on that time horizon where we'll go. I think it's 1.5 seconds. And this is the local map in the body fixed frame of the sensor. Uh, and so this video here quickly shows uh, that transport. So we stand there for a moment, and then we begin to walk. Uh, and uh, one thing to note is this is like a bird's eye view, so there's a little bit of warping around here. So it may look like you're intersecting with obstacles, but this is just an artifact of the uh, bird's eye view, a little bit of warping that's going on from the camera. So you can actually see from the side, this is the top and this is bottom, so there's a height difference here uh, that you're seeing. But what uh, I really want to uh, emphasize is the fact that if you speed this up, you can see that uh, we do a really good job of predicting where you want to go. So a common question is, well, what if you know, for some reason, one of these predictions puts you in a wall, right? Well, you hope not, but if it does, uh, again, this was a planning uh, component. You can then have a controller on the lower level, which then says, is this uh, pose actually feasible? Should I actually try to achieve that configuration? And then we began to transpose that to a robot. So thinking about like just the geometric description of the controller that you have, um, as you carry this, there's a grasp constraint. You can't 
rotate more than 90 degrees if you're holding this facing the, the human. So this needs to be a part of it. But if you can plan where you believe the human would go, you can actually use this as a feed forward term um, and then use compliance as your feedback term uh, to allow you to walk uh, with the human, hopefully uh, conserving energy for optimal transport. So looking at that entire problem, we're able to estimate the human intended pose, uh, which allows us to estimate uh, 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 where the human wants to go. Once we have an idea, we can plan a feasible trajectory in the free space, um, and then we know how to move in that direction if we know where uh, our, our collaborators are grasping the system. And so between these two uh, systems, we really looked at uh, the ability to pour from common containers, adapt to new containers, pour precisely, and we didn't require a lot of augmentation of our environment. Uh, and then for carrying, we are able to opt perform optimal transport uh, and propose a system that would allow us to plan collision-free trajectories and minimize interaction forces um, and estimate where the human wanted to go. And so the future is how can we extend these notions to other human-robot uh, collaboration cases, possibly again in carrying, perhaps in motion, um, uh, in working with rehabilitation, uh, as well as in uh, helping first responders. Uh, so in summary, you know, we have these two cases and I think there's a lot of interesting space uh, for robotic assistance. I want to quickly acknowledge uh, all my collaborators um, and resources and just emphasize again that we've covered just one phase of what the ARM lab hopes to tackle, but really we want to look at how can you know, these robots understand their environment, understand the people they're working with, and understand their role that they play. Thank you very much. The dynamics by using a uh, different viscosity, let's say honey. Yeah. Uh, uh, how would you change your setup? So um, that's a good question. So the question was, what if the viscosity of the fluid changed? How would this change the setup? Uh, so the most of it would remain the same. Um, so the max volume curve you could imagine would remain constant because if you hold it there at the transient time, it would ultimately uh, still be effective. But the time delay would actually change. Right? And so that time delay uh, that you'd expect for, the, for it to transpose, we actually used uh, machine learning based on the NVIDIA Flex modeling to approximate all of those terms. So um, I'm, I love reduced order analytical methods, but as you know, like the Navier Stokes doesn't have a closed form. So if we can actually use you know, NVIDIA Flex to have a good approximation of what we'd expect, that's great. So what I would tell you like right away would be go into NVIDIA Flex, tune that to Honey, then have a model for that. And you could even imagine having multiple models and having a system that allows you to span that space depending on what you're observing in terms of how fast something is pouring. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah? Um, how did you find the live jump function when you're doing stability calculations? Yeah, so, um, so this, is, this is actually a great question. I, I could start a whole class lecture on that. Uh, but like, you know, life and all, finding life and all functions is traditionally difficult, especially the more complex your systems become. Um, so uh, one notion you can take, and I'll quickly describe it, like, so you should take my class uh, that I'll teach in dynamic simulation <laughs> control. But like, uh, really, if you think about your state space and you can um, denote stability, uh, essentially whatever controller you want, you want that final region to be a stable region that you'll stay inside of, right? And the controller uh, input, you can think of as actually augmenting that final state manifold dynamics. And so the Lipanol function that you have uh, that you want to actually show produces stability uh, really produces level sets around that stability region that you have, which is why a lot of times it looks like energy because uh, it gives you that nice level set ability, uh, level set representation. But when you go through that process, the intuition is you're thinking about level sets and what controller input changes your manifold structure such that you can actually have those level sets that you're going into, and that is the definition of stability. <laughs> yeah? Um, for the precision pouring models, do they also take into account potentially granular materials like sands, crystals, powders, um, or is it just for fluids? So she asked uh, for the precision pouring model, uh, can you think about granular uh, materials, not just fluids? So that's a great question. So I had one internship a long time ago where I actually worked with a uh, uh, Talanol, and um, I can tell you, like, powders are crazy, right? Like, sometimes the, you'll, you'll pour, and then they'll, like, shear, and they, it's crazy. Uh, if it's more granular, 
um, like you could think like sugar, um, then I argue that it might be possible to approximate that similar to uh, how you'd expect fluid to behave. If your particles are really big, then you may even want to think about like the actual uh, dynamics, how it interacts with the container itself, like where's the center mass and all of these sort of things. Um, but if you, again, uh, similar to his question, you could totally imagine if you use some simulating software to make the basis for your model, you could increase the size of particles in that space and that could help you understand what the expected behavior was if those you know, uh, interactions like with the container are you know, uh, negligible. If you understand, uh, yeah. 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 Um, I guess you're talking about with the, um, you're saying that you could tune the model with the NVIDIA flow. Right. Um, what about potentially like learning those, like the viscosity parameter by say doing like, some sample for me? Is that something you've considered? Or so uh, we did do some to actually validate the NVIDIA model in the first place. But um, you know, you could totally imagine, right, doing such a thing. So if you think about like, you know, uh, for deployment purposes, if I'm thinking product, I would say you would totally want to just have something that automatically went through the range to give you that range of, and that huge range of your data set so that you could have that region to sample from. Um, but you could totally imagine doing real experiments as well. You just won't be able to do as many, um, but they will be possibly more accurate. But then you'd also have to consider the container space as well, because that was a, an entire uh, 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 manifold itself. So. Yeah. Uh, a more high-level question. I was thinking, you mentioned something about um, you know, why you want to minimize tool change, so you don't want to need to like swap out a pipette kind of thing. Right. And I'm I'm thinking here like it's it almost seems like it's easier to swap out a pipette and pipette something. And I'm wondering yeah. where you think of this scale of um, like mimicking human motion versus like there might be an easier platform that a robot could do. I don't yeah. know if you're familiar with the coffee making machine, arm machine, in one of the models in SF. Yeah. It, it's definitely that one's full on for cool factor, and you could just easily have a platform with dispensers. And I'm wondering sure. where you think this part in robot stands in this. Yeah. Line. So if I sum up your question, she's saying pipettes work great. Like why not use them? Uh, so uh, I would argue like you're correct. I would say you know our objective is to say can we insert these robots into human based environments. And we want them to be able to operate almost as closely to people as, as we can and give them the tools to do that. If you know, you're doing an extremely small problem that is not of free form pouring, you'll absolutely need to use a pipette. And my question would be, you know, is it possible to actually have, in that example, would the robot be able to manipulate a pipette that exists and is normally used by humans as opposed to one that needs to augment them? Right? I'm working with Juan, and we're trying to give our fingers dexterity so that we can interact with a world that exists and not one that we have to augment for our ability. That's a good point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, quick question about uh, Orion again. Uh, if you were to, how would you be able to estimate uh, for like a thermos, like, let's say, since you don't necessarily know what the actual container is that holds the liquid, if it has like you know some vacuum in between? Ah, uh, 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 uh. okay, that's a great question. So he said, like, what if you were pouring from a thermos? But the inner part of that was the same, you know, and I like your question. It was really good, insightful. He understood that I was making the assertion that as I scan my container geometry, I'm assuming that the wall is almost infinitely thin. So if it's very large, like a thermos case, right, that might be a very poor approximation, right? So uh, in the current setup, uh, then you'd have to definitely rely more on the system identification model. And here is, I would pitch again the semi-parametric because it's just, it's not behaving the way you'd expect it to, right? And if you see that divergence, you need to adapt, right? So um, I think there's an interesting perception side of the problem that you've mentioned. And then there's also a very interesting, you know, system identification side um, as well, you know, and moving forward, you know, you try to, you want to try to address both, but that's, that's definitely a good, and, and that's a good research question. Uh, I got two here. Uh, your abstract notes that this is motivated by a collaboration with a local pharma company. Can yeah. you uh, comment or elaborate on what this motivation, like what's the underlying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, when it was pitched to us like three years ago, uh, they were saying how uh, their scientists spend a lot of time actually just pouring you know, these, uh, these mixtures in order to test this on the small rapid research scale, right? And so they, this was pitched literally from them to say, could you have a robot that could assist, you know, in this particular uh, free pouring task to speed up their time? Yeah. Mass or tried to like measure like the weight of what you're pouring or maybe yeah. the torque to try yeah. and like I guess yeah. instead of just vision. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, one I actually received a couple of times, so I have a really good answer for you. Uh, so uh, the question is, you know, can you think about the mass of the container that you're holding uh, to help you in the pour? And the short answer is you could think of that. More information is always better. Uh, I think it would particularly help you in the fall time because the mass would change once the fluid had exited, so you could just remove that fall time from the time delay. Um, but, you know, if I hold this container, you know, its transition of the, the fluid uh, won't register as a change of mass until it exits. So imagine rotating this way too far, almost instantaneously, the mass didn't change. Uh, but if you stopped there at that angle, you would have drastic effects of the fluid, you know, falling down below that, that pouring line. And so the mass, holding the mass of the container only really helps, seems to help you when it comes to estimating that fall time and not internally what's going on. But if you had torque involved in there, maybe you could say, you know, how does the shifting of the container work? But then this is an entire new projection of the geometry model. And if you have that in the first place, the question is what best form should it take? So 